been a big fan of Jim Pink's work for a lot of years. Jim was on the road when I caught up with him. And we tried to record this interview using Skype, but the bandwidth at his hotel wasn't great. So I used Skype and called his cell phone. His line was a little too hot on the recording, so there's a tiny pop. Stay with me here. I compressed it and I cleaned it up. But most important, Dan gave me a great interview, and I know you're going to love it. I'm a huge fan of your work, and as somebody who grew up in the staffing industry, I guess you came to my attention with Free Agent Nation, and then I followed you into a whole new mind, which I thought was brilliant. I struggled with Drive, but only because I think probably like a lot of people, your insights challenge you know, conventional thinking about incentives and motivation especially as a salesperson, I was challenged by that. But then I saw when you first started promoting to sell as human and I thought, oh no, you know, Pink, a civilian is going to write a book about sales. And in, in my mind, you don't learn to swim by reading a book. You get thrown into the deep end and you struggle uh, against yourself and against the water for some time. So I was completely prepared to hate this book but I had to read it anyway because it's in my domain and I fell in love with it. And, and I'll set you up here with this. You capture, I think, some of the biggest changes that we've experienced in sales and you confirmed with a lot of research or, and I think this outsider's view that you brought to this that confirms a lot of what I've written about and talked about uh, on my blog for the last three years. You also just make what I think is a, a very compelling case for this uncomfortable truth that most people deal with, that they're really in sales. And the last thing in the world they want to be thought of as being a salesperson or being salesy. But your, your insight, I think, is we do have to be better at selling. And most of what we do is getting somebody to, to take some action or give up some resource that will benefit them in the long run, but also benefit us. So I know that's a long setup. But let me, I guess, start with this question. How did you get here? What, what hooked you on this idea and this insight that we're all in sales so much that you decided to write to sell as human? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for the kind words about the, um, thanks for the kind words about the, the book. Um, that I, I, and the, the answer to that question is actually really rooted in your introduction, Anthony. Uh, here's, what, here's, what, here's what happened. So I wrote this book called Drive uh, that you've mentioned, and that book makes it fairly straightforward argument based on 50 years of social science that there's a kind of motivator out there that we use in organizations called an if, that I call an if-then motivator. Uh, if you do this, then you get that. And what I found looking at 50 years of social science is that if-then motivators are pretty effective for simple, routine, what psychologists call algorithmic tasks, turning the same screw the same way on an assembly line or adding up columns of figures, whatever, uh, but it's not as good for more complex, creative, conceptual tasks. That's sort of the central idea of, of, of that book. And so one of the things that I've done in, in my book is I'll put my email address on the jacket. And I started getting emails from people um, very much like you were mentioning. Um, hey, I'm in sales. Does this mean that we shouldn't have commissions for salespeople? Uh, other questions, what about sales? Then I started hearing from companies, uh, not a lot, but, uh, but a surprising number saying, this is really interesting. Now, now I understand what happened in my company when we, we eliminated sales commissions and sales actually improved. And so I was just curious about these things, wanted to answer questions sensibly. So I started looking around at um, the world of, of sales, a world I didn't know very well at all. And I, thought, I just, guess I discovered two things. First, uh, there wasn't, um, like, except for your blog, there wasn't a huge amount of uh, really sensible, smart stuff written in this realm. Um, and, this, and the other one was that it's, unbelievably interesting and really important, and I felt that people didn't take it seriously. So the more I started learning about it, the more I became interested in it, the more I found it fascinating. And I thought, again, going back to your introduction, that maybe people would benefit from an outsider's, uh, an outsider's view uh, of this, someone coming at this whole realm with fresh eyes. And, and you're not really an outsider, though, and because I think in the setup, and if somebody goes to your website, uh, danpink.com, they can download the introduction, at some point, you realize that most of what you do is selling. How, wh when did you get struck by that insight? Well, you know, it's, I'm not a guy who has a lot of epiphanies, but what I did do uh, 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 now a couple of years ago uh, was, you know, I was working, 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 and, and, and I felt like I wasn't sure what I was actually doing. And so um, I actually this bizarre thing where I took about I took an afternoon and intentionally went through what I'd done the previous two weeks and 
looked at what meetings I had. Um, I tried to, you know, recreate, uh, create some of the phone calls that I had done, looked at my emails, my tweets and whatnot. And I realized, like, good God, I'm spending a huge portion of my time selling. And it's not necessarily selling books, getting someone to go to their local independent bookseller or Barnes and Noble and put down a credit card and buy a copy of Free Agent Nation. Um, but it was more just, you know, trying to get my son to take a shower after baseball practice or, um, at a airline day trying to get an agent to switch me from a window seat to an aisle seat or, uh, talking to my neighbor and trying to convince him that his garbage can should go somewhere else. And, um, and I thought one of the things that I've noticed in writing about work is when it, it, it's actually helpful to try to extrapolate from your own experiences. That I feel like if I am doing something like this, chances that are good that other people are too. Um, and that was one of the cat. That was another one of the catalysts for this. And it goes actually again to something you said in the setup, which is, um, which I think is which is right. I mean, how do you learn to swim? Do you read a book about swimming, or do you get thrown into the water? And I think this is a case where I wrote a book about swimming, but in part because everyone's already in the water. <laughs> they are. They don't. They don't want to be, but they are. We're selling. They, all the and time. they may not even know it. They're just kind of flapping around, saying, "What's going on here? I'm all wet." Um, and so, uh, so, so that's really what it is. It's, uh, I hadn't thought about it quite that way until you until your introduction. Selling has changed a lot, and I, I tell a story when I speak about being a reluctant salesperson. I'm supposed to be still fronting a rock band, you know, in California, and and living a very different life than the one that I have now in my mind. So, I would have never been a salesperson if it was about what it was about throughout history. And I think over the past couple decades, and and you describe it as the last hundred years. Selling has changed dramatically. What what did you hook on to? What changes did you see that have occurred over the last hundred years, and why have why do those changes matter now? Yeah, I, I think it's a um, it, it's it's a, it's a number of things, but at the at the core of it, at the core of most of these changes is changes in information, and in particular, most of what we know about sales is comes from a world of information asymmetry where the seller always had more information than the buyer. So think about 20 years ago when, you know, you were, you were fronting a rock band for, uh, in Los Angeles. If you went to a Chevy dealer in LA, um, to buy a car, that Chevy dealer would know a lot more about cars, a lot more about Chevy than you ever could. Information asymmetry. The seller always had more information than the buyer. This is one reason why you're not alone in, in, in being a reluctant salesperson because we are reluctant to associate with this profession because that information asymmetry has long given salespeople an incredible edge. If I know a lot more than you, a lot more than you, I can rip you off. If I know a lot more than you and you don't have very many choices and you don't have a means to talk back, I can take the low road. I don't, I mean, I don't have to take the low road and maybe I don't take it every single time, but I have to take the low road and therefore people, this is why we have the principle of, of buyer beware. Buyers have to beware. And sellers know a lot more. But now let's go to your, you know, let's let's go to another 25 year old uh, in LA right now, uh, fronting a rock band. Today, she can go into a Chevy dealer and arguably know more about Chevys than that she, than than the person selling the car. She can go in there um, knowing the average price of uh, what other dealers are selling Chevys for. Uh, she can go in there knowing uh, talking to user groups for that particular make and model. I interviewed a car uh, car dealer in Washington D.C. with my my uh, home t- my now hometown, and she said that when she started selling cars in the 1980s, the factory invoice price of the car was locked into the safe. Even the salespeople weren't allowed to see it. Now that rock and roll rising rock and roll star in L.A. can walk into the Chevy dealer with the factory invoice price. So that so the big change is we've moved from information asymmetry to something close, at least, to information parity. And what that means is that we live in a world, we used to live in a world solely of buyer beware. Now we live in a world more of buyer beware and seller beware. Sellers have to beware when buyers have lots of choices, lots of information, and the means to talk back. I, I think you're right about that. The, and let's, I'm going to move you through a couple of these things. Um, this ABCs, and I, I remember... Uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, one of my favorite movies, the Alec Baldwin scene, and the always be closing. You've identified 
a new set of ABCs uh, for salespeople. It's attunement, uh, buoyancy, and clarity. Can you describe uh, just quickly each one of these and, and why they're critical to selling well today? Why the new ABCs? Sure. Uh, so, A, attunement. Uh, attunement is perspective taking. Um, can you understand where the other person is coming from? This is um, essential in any kind of effort to, to persuade, influence, sell people, um, and in, including, uh, including online. And so, attunement is, can, you know, what, attunement is, so I, I, in the treatment I draw on that social science to say, what can we do to get better at taking someone else's perspective? What can we do better at seeing the world through their eyes? Uh, buoyancy, be buoyancy, is um, all salespeople know, and, and most people, civilians, are realizing this as they uh, enter the world of sales um, against their wishes, is that you, you're, not in a, you're not in a swimming pool. You are in what one seller calls an ocean of rejection. Uh, being in sales means being rejected, and most people don't do very well on that. And buoyancy is the quality of how do you stay afloat in that ocean of rejection? How do you stay afloat in that ocean of rejection by, again, looking at the social science, which tells us some clues about what to do before an encounter, what to do during, what to do after. And finally, it's clarity. Uh, clarity is, and, and part of response to information, again, has gone from information asymmetry, not only to information parity, but information overload. So. Clarity is how do you make sense of this welter of information that's out there, distill the meaningful patterns, clarify it for people, take these murky situations and make them um, easier to understand. And also, very importantly, how do you move from problem solving as a skill to problem finding as a skill? There's a, there's a new premium on not only on solving problems, but on identifying problems people don't know that they have. So these three things, attunement, buoyancy, and clarity, end up being some qualities that are extraordinarily effective in both traditional sales and non-sales selling. Yeah, the clarity is an interesting one because the biggest, I think, trend in, in the, the fashion lately right now is what we call insight-based selling, and uh, it's, it's built off of some research by the Sales Executive Council on the Challenger sale, but that is really what our clients are looking for is help, help understanding what's going on and how to make sense of it and how to produce better results. I want to point you back just to buoyancy real quick, if you don't mind. It's resilience, sure. it's determination. And I'm fascinated that you found the last Fuller Brush guy in America. And <laughs> so much of this story is carried through the book, and it's a great story, uh, and it's a great character that you found. Can you just riff on for just a quick minute on how did you find the Fuller Brush guy and, and the rejection that he dealt with and how he framed that? Well, what was interesting is that I was I started doing some research on um, thinking about um, kind of the quintessential kinds of selling that took, has taken place in America over the last hundred years, and immediately remembered uh, Fuller Brush. So I started doing some research on Fuller Brush. It, it ends up being a really the whole history of the company ends up being really interesting. And I started contacting the company and contacting people who I knew, saying that there's got to be a Fuller Brush, so a few Fuller Brush people still around. And it turned out as I started looking at this network of full of brush salespeople that, um, that a lot of them were actually setting up basically virtual stores, online full of brush stores, but very few of them. But I, I, I figured there's got to be somebody still going door to door. And through this network of full of people, I, I identified this guy named Norman Hall. And I had a hard time finding him, but he ends up, he's a part-time actor. So I found this community theater in Northern California where he's done a play, and I called the community, reached out to the community theater there, and saying, "Hey, I'm trying to find this guy named Norman Hall who appeared in a community theater play, uh, you know, two years ago." <laughs> and and I totally lucked out because instead of um, um, uh, reaching, thinking, they're thinking that I was a crackpot. I the, the person on the phone said, um, "Oh." Um, uh, it's funny, uh, I, I read a book by a guy named Daniel Pink called A Whole New Mind. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And so I, um, <laughs> that's how, so that's how I found him. And I, and, and anyways, I, I ended up spending a lot of time with him in, in San Francisco. He's a terrific guy, really smart, interesting guy with a great story. Not a young guy, though. Oh, no, no, he's 75. Yeah. Uh, he's been doing this for 40 years. Um, going door to door, really in the business district of San Francisco. Tell me how he, he gets rejected in the book on, on a number of occasions. What, what's his philosophy for dealing with that rejection? 
Well, I mean, part of it is the old-fashioned view, not old, not old-fashioned in the sense of wrong or bad, but but the, the sort of the enduring view of uh, it's partly a number of things. Yeah. Um, that um, you know, you can make a lot of sales calls, and you know, you're going to get a certain yield, and the more calls you make, uh, the more, I mean, if you know what your yield is going to be, the more calls you make, the better off you'll do, which is absolutely sensible. The other thing that's interesting about Norman is that. If you look at some of the research on 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 buoyancy, on on um, I, you know you call it resilience and, uh, or, or grit or how people stay optimistic and bounce back, he is just a an embodiment, a uh, reflection of all the things that the science tells us that we should be doing. Uh, for instance, uh, Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania has some um, now very classic research showing that. The best predictor of sales success for this army of life insurance salesmen he studied a few several years ago is their explanatory style. How do they explain failure? And when Norman gets rejected, he explains it in a way that is perfectly consistent with what the social science tells us we should be doing to remain buoyant, which is to explain things uh, not as a per- not as personal. Uh, uh, the sales call didn't go. This um, sales this sale didn't work out because I'm an idiot and I ruined it. Uh, don't explain it that way. Um, don't explain it as this always happens and don't explain it as this is going to ruin everything. And so Seligman teaches us to explain failures in an honest way, um, look for ways that they're not personal, not pervasive, and not permanent. And I think Norman does this very, very naturally. And as a result, he remains um, buoyant and positive most of the time, not all the time. Um, and one of the things that you see, one reason that I use the term buoyancy is that buoyancy is in some ways a mix between levity and lightness, but also gravity. Um, that is, you know, seriousness and getting good feedback and having some negative experiences to steal your spine and, and teach you things. So it isn't, buoyancy is, you know, staying afloat. It isn't going up into the ether. My uh, number two uh, attribute that salespeople have to possess to be successful after self-discipline is optimism. And I, I love the story where Norman goes to drop off the delivery with the two lawyers and he makes the sales call mm-hmm. down the hall that he does the introduction to and he doesn't make the sale but he says to you something to the effect of I didn't get anything but I definitely feel like I'm going to get something from him next time you know and he still yeah, no, that was, that, yeah no that was remarkable that was um that was a uh, that was that was for a, a writer reporter that was like a, a dream come true because we ended up having to sit and talk in a break room because he was going to make a delivery to the lawyer, the lawyers didn't show up. So he and I ended up in this break room just shooting the breeze. Um, and then a woman walks in from down the hall, and he starts trying to sell her. And then he goes to the sales call that I didn't accompany him on. I wait downstairs for him. He doesn't make the sale, but then he says, you know, I think there's going to be a chance to get her next time. It was just, <laughs> it was, it was for for a writer, for a reporter, it was just like uh, um, um, gold coins are falling from the sky into my pocket. It's so funny, too, and I can just see the glamorous view of selling that you get walking door-to-door in San Francisco and waiting in a break room. Um, the, <laughs> the, the yeah, next... well, yeah, or, or, or going, going, in the, uh, going in the back room of, uh, of, uh, of clothing stores talking about um, uh, cleaning supplies and how to properly mop the floor. Glamorous. You, you've, yeah. got a, you've got a how-to section in the book um, with, with three big ideas in there, too, and, and I like the way that you broke this down. We don't need to dive into each of them, but it's pitch, improvise, and serve. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, I love the section on pitch. You've got a couple things there that really resonate with me, and I think it begins with the section on pitching a movie. Um, am I right about that? Mm. It, it, yeah. Um, for pitching yeah. to a producer, and I, I've said this on the blog a number of times, but... If it's a choice between my story, your story, or our story, our story is the story that wins. Can you uh, can you riff on that for a minute on what you learned about that? Well, for, I, I'd actually I, I I I'm happy to riff on it. I wish I had actually come up with that because that's the perfect. That's actually a better way to explain it than what I did. Um, that's ex- I mean that's exactly what this research shows. Uh, I looked at some research by some professors at UC Davis and. Stanford, that looking looking at the Hollywood pitch process, uh, this is a pretty exhaustive study of writers and producers going in, uh, writers going in and pitching uh, entertainment executives. And what it did is it showed that the purpose of a pitch isn't to convert 
say, oh, you're right, Dan, this is a great idea. Let me sign the line that has got it. But instead, to invite participation. And, and what you said is precisely it. It's not my story or your story. It's our story. And the more it becomes an invitation to collaborate and contribute, the more successful it is. Now, now maybe I'm naive, but I found that actually quite um, interesting because I'd always thought, even myself, when I go into a pitch, um, you know, pitching a book or pitching a magazine idea, that it was really much like, okay, here we go. What can I do to convince you? That it's basically, you know, I'm trying to convince you. I'm trying to get you to agree with me when instead the, the, the more effective way to do it is to go from my story to our story. It's a, it's a collaboration, and I think that that's probably one of the biggest changes over the last 20 years and why this idea of the clarity and the insight is so important. It's because most of the time our clients have some ideas of their own, and if we can marry sure. them up together, it's easier to get an agreement than if we try to force ours uh, on them. I, I think that's one of the things that a lot of salespeople do come into this with the idea that I walk in with my PowerPoint and I pitch, but if it's our PowerPoint and it's our story, it's a different presentation. Precisely. I mean, I mean, really, Anthony, if there's one, if, 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 for, for all of us are pitching all the time, but if there's one kind of meta takeaway in this, beyond the tactical ways to pitch, it's it's that bigger idea that you're announcing of, like, what's the point of the exercise of a pitch? And that's really important. And for me, again, being naive and being an outsider, that was very important to me. It, it, it has changed the way that I do those kinds of encounters. Interesting. Uh, you you gained the insight and you've changed your approach because of it. Absolutely, and, that, and not only and, and in some other parts of the book too. I mean, of the books that I've written, this is you know I have experience of researching it and going out and doing the reporting and um, coming back and looking over my notes and and you know, typing up my notes or getting to write sections and saying, God, this is you know I could actually use this. Um, if you if you look at something like. Um, um, I think there's something too. You mentioned earlier the challenger sale and insights. I think there's something you know, big in that that changed the way I look at things. Um, even in the tactical side of pitching, I am much more inclined to pitch uh, with uh, questions, which I think have the same. It's actually very similar to what you're talking about. Questions operate differently, but questions are are themselves an invitation to uh, questions are themselves an invitation to participate. Uh, when you look at something like the like attunement, the both the cognitive and physical sides of attunement were are stuff that I feel like hmm, I can get a lot better at this. Um, buoyancy, um, you know, how do you the, the lessons on how do you explain failure were interesting to me. So, um, so you know, I, I I enjoyed writing and researching this book because I was learning so much, and that's the other great thing about you know at least for the author of coming in with a beginner's mind. It's like, whoa, this stuff is so incredibly interesting, so incredibly helpful. The other takeaway also was that it really aggravates me is this, is this notion out there that, that sales is for people who couldn't get jobs as engineers. And I think that's absolute crap. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed talking to salespeople, interviewing salespeople, is just how incredibly difficult, how incredibly intellectually sophisticated um, this is in so many cases. It's a, it's a tough job. What's interesting to me about a couple of things that you've said is I've written a blog post a day for three years, and some of the things that you've identified in a much more sophisticated way than I've said them as a practitioner, I, I've said good good questions are better than any good statement mm -hmm. that you might have. They're just more powerful as the impact that they have, and you've got the research to back it mm -hmm. up where I've just got the experience of sitting on sales calls and doing a lot of the work you did walking around with Norman. Um, it's interesting where you took this. It's a question that I've got, and I'll let you just answer this real quickly, and I've got one more for you. But your feelings changed about salespeople in the profession. Uh, one of it is I think you found it more intellectual. What else did you learn? What What else changed about how you feel about the profession of sales? Well, I mean, again, it's, it's all of these things. So, I mean, I, I didn't necessarily, I didn't, you know, I, I personally didn't think, oh, sales is for um Sales is 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 um, isn't as challenging as say being a, an engineer or being an accountant or being a lawyer, um, but I knew that perception was out there. So um, I, I, my view is changed. my view is that that perception is actually idiotic. <laughs> that it shows like you have no idea what what salespeople what salespeople do. Uh, so that's number one. But I guess another big uh, the other thing that I noticed is how much the actual 
what people actually do on the job selling today diverges from the view that many people have of sales as sleazy, low-brow, low-rent, the view embodied in all of America, basically all American pop culture account of salespeople, whether it's um, Willie Loman in Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman or it's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross that you mentioned earlier, or you know Herb Tarlek on WKRP in Cincinnati. I forgot uh, that, that one. The, the, gap, <laughs> the gap between the, the um, kind of pop culture portrayal of salespeople and the fact of what salespeople actually do is gigantic. So that was another um, that was another takeaway for me. And the other, I guess, the sort of biggest takeaway was that, especially today, the ability to do this well, it, it draws on such fundamentally human qualities that it isn't this kind of fakery. It isn't a, a, a kind of accommodation to um, you know greediness or manipulation. That actually the people who do it well are people who want to serve others, who listen, who are honest. Uh, and who have a kind of transcendent view of what they're doing. And I'm pretty convinced that we're moving, not immediately, but something that's going on here is analogous to what happened in leadership uh, 40 years ago when Robert Greenleaf came out with this idea of servant leadership, which was a bizarre concept. He said leaders serve first and lead second, and he flipped the pyramid, saying leaders are, we think of leaders at the bottom, not at the top. And I think what's going on now is, is an emergence of something close to servant sales, where you you serve first and you sell later. And again, this this congruence of forces shows that selling isn't this kind of this green economy accommodation to the merciless world of commerce, but it's actually something that's fundamentally human. I, I talk about it as we create value before we claim any, and I think. For a lot of That's a, good way to put it too, a, yeah. a lot of history, it was we need to claim whether or not we create, and that was this idea of always be closing, even if you weren't yep. a value creator. And I think that's what's flipped, and why I'm in the profession is because I realized I had the ability to go and make a difference for other people, and making a difference from other people made selling easy, um, because I like to make a difference and help other people produce better outcomes than they could. So, last question, and th- this one. Uh, I, I thought you got here through drive. I just had the sense of reading this that this got mm-hmm. you. You came to this through drive, and I that would seem very natural for me after reading both books. But so after you write drive and you discover the real sources of motivation, and now that you've spent some time on sales, um, what do you think about compensation and and bonus structures and incentives for salespeople? Can you marry those two books up now in your mind? Yeah, um, I think it's a complicated question, and that's why I saved it for us. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a complicated question in the sense that I don't think there's like a, a single formulaic answer that, that formulaic uh, a compensation system that applies uniformly. Um, and so I, I'll give you. We, we tend to think that, that the best way to motivate salespeople is with commissions. Um, you know, give them a low base salary or maybe even no base salary and simply a draw. And uh, the commissions will get them motivated because they're going to be trying to survive. Uh, I'm not actually sold on that, no pun intended. I'm not convinced that that's necessarily the best way to go. And I have found in a number of companies, as I mentioned earlier in our in your interview, uh, that have eliminated sales commissions and seen sales go up. Now, what they've done instead is they give people, um, you know, very healthy. First of all, they hire great people. Second of all, they um, give people very healthy base salaries, and then um, some kind of maybe small variable compensation. So my view on all of this is that we need to challenge the orthodoxy that commissions are the only thing that motivates salespeople, that salespeople are purely and unalterably coin-operated. I don't think that's universally true. And so my view is let's challenge the orthodoxy that salespeople are the only way, so commissions are the only way to compensate salespeople, the best way to compensate salespeople, and instead you know, experiment with what works and what doesn't work. Um, I tend to prefer, forget about sales. My design principles for compensation are, are essentially, for all professions, are, are essentially the, uh, I, I really think it's important to pay people healthy base salaries. Um, so they're not, people, if people are worried that they're not going to pay their mortgage at the end of the month, they don't do their best work. So first of all, hire great people. I think much more intense hiring practices to make sure who you let through the door is someone you want to be hanging out with and someone you want part of your company. 
hire great people, healthy base salaries, and then I actually believe in some portion of, not just a large portion, but some portion of variable compensation tied to very clear, uh, important, hard-to-game uh, metrics, uh, both on individual performance and on, and on group performance. That's the design principles. Um, when the rubber meets the road, uh, things can often go awry, but that's generally my, my view. It's interesting. I had a conversation with uh, Gerhard Schwatner from Selling Power a couple weeks ago, and one of the things that he asked me was, "How do you motivate salespeople?" And I don't. I'm I'm with you. I don't think there's one answer. Different people are motivated by yeah. different things. But we both went back to Drucker, you know, strat- culture eats strategy for breakfast, and I think some of that's true here right. too. I think that mo- motivation, a lot of it's intrinsic. And we, we mm-hmm. want to do what's easy for us. So you design compensation, and, and that, that seems to be the easiest answer because all the other answers are much more difficult. You know, how, how do you build a culture where that's people intrinsically yeah. want to succeed? Well, that's a harder question to answer, just like leadership. You know, the, the real answer for leadership is a much harder answer, too. Yeah, absolutely. And I really do think that's, that's an excellent point. I think that's really one reason why. Uh, sales organizations then do, do rely largely on, on commissions because um, it's, 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 it's easy. It's, it's relatively easy to administer. Um, it's what we've always done, and it's not a deviation from past tradition. Um, and but I, I, so that's why I'm for that's why I'm for challenging the orthodox. I I also think that um, it's interesting. I was I was at a, a Microsoft. I'm here in, talking to you here in Seattle and. At Microsoft yesterday and talking to a, a sales manager there and he was saying that he's managed salespeople and he's managed other people at Microsoft and he was saying that he thinks the sales their data showed that their salespeople are actually far more satisfied with their jobs than than any other division and I think the reason for that is that is in some ways related to commissions or adjacent to commissions and the fact that they have clear goals and lots of feedback and and it's a fair system, it's a transparent system, and people know how they're doing. And so there's that aspect of sales that makes that is also motivational. You're you know what you're supposed to do. You get very clear feedback on how you're doing it, and and um, at some level, at least partly variable compensation based on individual performance is fair. Can we close this with you giving a pitch for the book? I know there's a pitch that you wrote <laughs> for the book. Can you give us a Pixar pitch for the book? The Pixar pitch is, is a pitch that reflects the narrative structure of all Pixar movies. Pixar movies, Emma Coates, who's a story editor there, says, um, are built on basically six sentences. So it goes, once upon a time there was blank. Every day, blank. One day, blank. Because of that, blank. Because of that, blank. Until finally, blank. And it's actually quite remarkable because you can take every Pixar movie and and summarize it using those six sentences. So I think you can also summarize this book, and then as you mentioned, uh, like like this: Once upon a time, only some people were in sales. Uh, every day they sold stuff, we did stuff, and everyone was happy. One day, everything changed. All of us ended up in sales, and sales changed from a world of buyer beware to a world of seller beware. Because of that. We had to learn the new ABCs, attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. Because of that, we had to learn some new pitch skills to pitch, to improvise, and to serve. Until finally, we realized that selling isn't some grim accommodation to a merciless world of commerce. It's part of who we are, and therefore something we can do better by being more human. And my pitch is, uh, I, I'm a sales guy, and I've got the sales pedigree. I've spent my life in there. And I wanted, I started off by saying this, I didn't want to like this book. But if you're a salesperson, <laughs> or if you're a non-salesperson, you're going to pick this up, and you're going to see so many things that maybe you're going to resonate with, but you haven't formed some concrete ideas around. I think this book will help you form some concrete ideas. And Dan does a great job putting some action steps around uh, attunement, buoyancy, clarity, pitch, improvise, and serve. If you're a non-salesperson, I think you'll particularly like this because it will give you some framework about thinking about how do I bring myself to this work that I may not uh, be as comfortable with, especially thinking of myself as a salesperson. Dan, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Anthony, thanks for having me. It was a great, uh, really interesting conversation, and I'm grateful that you had me on the program. Dan's a super smart guy. I love to sell as human. If you're in sales, a lot of what Dan writes may challenge what you believe, but I think he does a brilliant job capturing what's changed in sales over the last couple decades. If you're a non-sales person, to sell as human might change your mind and give you some new ideas. Thanks for being here. Find me at thesalesblog.com. See you next week in the arena.